Hey guys, Max with Hobby King back here with another product profile for you guys. And today we have the new version two of the Hobby King 1875 millimeter B17. Now, of course, since it's a warbird, we have to talk to Tom Hunt. So we're here at our flying field out in New York and we brought Tom with us to talk about the new B17. Yes, great looking model. Um, I never did see the version one model, um, but uh, the, I've been reading the RC groups all about it. And guys are very enamored with the original V1. They'll be uh, probably even more impressed with the V2 because of the changes, structural changes. It's got uh, wing spars in it that it didn't have before, uh, improved landing gear and better ground handling. Um, the uh, panel lines you can see are much more diminutive um, on it, making it a little bit nicer looking. And uh, obviously it's coming now in both the olive drab and the silver schemes mm -hmm. and I believe two different decal sets for each. Yep. And uh, now here we have the G model or the F, F model? This F is the F model, model. F and model. the G had the chin scoop right. um, underneath it, uh, the chin, not chin scoop, but the chin turret, um, twin 50 calibers on it as well. Um, the B-17 obviously was the iconic American bomber right. um, uh, during World War II, although they produced more B-24s and they probably flew more missions, uh, B-17s uh, dropped quite a bit of tonnage mm -hmm. um, in all theaters, even in the Pacific. In fact, little pe what, uh, you know, people who watched the Pearl Harbor movie, the first blood that the American bombers ever saw with American pilots in it was actually on the day of Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. They had a flight flying in and um, they started getting shot up by uh, you know, rogue zeros and, and were bombed on when they landed at the field, got bombed into oblivion. I don't know if uh, many of those airplanes actually survived uh, of the flight that flew in. Um, and then of course they were used in uh, deep into the Pacific. Um, and then when you got into later into the war, uh, they were primarily just a, uh, a European theater operation, the 8th Air Force, right. um, and uh, they flew out of Italy too. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, it wasn't until the advent of the long range Mustang that the, the, the loss rates went down from the high 30s into the high teens. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, bristling with guns, obviously, the uh, waist guns, the tail gun, the upper turret, lower turret, even guns sticking out the nose in some versions. And then there were, there were guys that did modifications of the field. Like, we do modifications to our models to make them look a little different. Guys at the field would add more guns. They'd right. just stick a gun out of every... <laughs> they'd get a crashed airplane and they'd pick up a gun and say, hey, you know, we can use this here and stick it out the top. They had some sticking out the top. So it was, it was a very utility uh, airplane. Um, had obviously long range and, uh, and did quite a bit of damage to the Third Reich in its time. All right, so thanks for that, Tom. Uh, so now I think we should go and take her up with some flying. What do you think? Great. Awesome. And then once we're uh, done with that, Stuart's actually going to take you back in the studio and he's going to do a full unboxing and a build. So let's get her up and flying. Super. Let's do it. All right, Tom, you all ready to take her up with some flying? All the controls are checked. I'm ready to go. All right, we have a little bit of a northerly breeze here. Light breeze. But should be a problem knots. for this guy. No problem. All right, let's go for it. Wow, that was really short for this size of a plane. It's great. Yeah, and uh, I try to make it reasonably scale, but scale for this uh, field would be uh, probably through the hoops out there. <laughs> <laughs> now that was no flaps on the takeoff? No flaps, no. Awesome. No reason to. Very lightly loaded airplane, mm -hmm. uh, even as big as it is and, and as heavy as you think it is, um, it's not an issue. And, and the three cell, the big three cell pack, I don't know what milliamp hour you got in there. 5,000. Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to allow this airplane to fly a long time. I'm barely at half throttle right now. And, you know, it flies convincingly, and, you know, obviously at full throttle, it probably flies way past scale um, speed type looking for this size airplane. Well, speaking of two things, first thing, you're right, three, a single 3S5000, it has an adapter in it now that you can just run a big single 3S pack, there we so, go. which is really easy for you guys if you just want to run one pack, but you can always run two if you feel like it. And uh, speaking of full throttle, you want to give us a high speed pass? Okay, here we're coming through with a high speed. I'll tell you, the four engines sound great coming oh, by on yeah. that thing at high speed. Yeah, it's nice to hear all four props singing. And of course, they are contra rotating on each side, so mm -hmm. you've got uh, literally no torque and no P effect from the propellers. So mm -hmm. um, Easier ground handling much, with that too? Much easier ground handling, and, and you know, you have to be kind of pointed into the wind because the large vertical tail on a B-17 is going to weather cock you anyway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if you're going to have to do, uh, you know, significant wind crosswind takeoffs, um, you know, it could be an issue because it's going to want a weathercock. So that, that's the only thing you really have to watch on a B-17. 
But I've been flying this thing a few times in a couple different scenarios, but it, it flies great. We haven't had any issues, no wind, plenty of wind, even this little bit of wind we have now, and it flies great, nice and stable, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, the, the large wingspan, it's, it's got a good weight to it. It's not overweight. It's not so light that it really bumps and grinds in, in a little bit of a breeze. It's easy to position wherever you want. The, um, the ailerons are very effective with the proper throws, mm -hmm. um, although I do add some rudder, you know, to make it a very coordinated turn, make it look more bomber-like. In fact, the airplane does fly. That was a rudder turn. Mm -hmm. Just rudder, no aileron at all. Yeah, it drops that wing down really yeah, nicely. It, because of the, you know, the dihedral, the scale dihedral of the airplane, the airplane flies very well with just a rudder command. So you can fly this airplane literally by, uh, you know, taking your hand off the yoke and just fly it rudder and throttle. <laughs> if the airplane is trimmed, I wouldn't be a bit surprised, you know, that you could fly an entire flight just by moving the left stick, rudder and throttle, make it go up and down with the throttle, mm -hmm. just turn it left and right with the rudder. The last few turns I've made no aileron input whatsoever. I may have actually cross-controlled a couple of times just to keep the wing from getting too high from the rudder input. Just now, absolutely nice. Now it flies really nicely scale. I believe we can do some aerobatics. I did some loops and rolls with it. What do you think? think All right, I'll take there? it upstairs and I'll do, next time around I'll take it upstairs and I'll do a roll for you. All right. I will say my favorite part is that rear gun turret sticking down. Yeah. That's a great part just on the tail yeah, there. The ball, the ball turret is really nice, uh, scale-like, and it does give the image. I mean, there are certain things that make a B-17 a B-17. The large glass nose, the ball turret, the upper turret, just that's, you know, you, you got to do those kinds of things. All right, here we go with a roll. Excellent. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> and we definitely don't, I do not have all the throws uh, cranked up in my radio. They, right. It's a little more set up for a little more docile flying, but still, even with everything not maxed out, plenty of authority to get through a roll nicely. Right. And I did add a little bit of rudder, I would say maybe quarter rudder in the Proverse with the roll to, mm -hmm. to help it around. I think a, a, an aileron roll on its own would be a little bit sluggish. More of a corkscrew too. Yeah, probably. so I'm going to do a little loop here. All right. Pull off the power to keep the G's from getting too high. Great. Nice. Great. And any airplane, any electric airplane, they can loop from level flight. It has got more than enough power to fly a uh, normal routine. All right, let's make a gear and flat pass now. Dirty pass, sounds yep, good. Dirty pass. Gear are coming down. I always wait till I'm on final. Put the flaps down. Yep, that's one thing you taught me. Always wait till you're on final to get all your flaps all right, up. Flaps are down. And now remember this, the B-17 will get very, very slow with everything out. You can fly it slow, but it's still very stable. The wings don't drop, nothing nope. gets squishy or anything like that. You can see the split flaps just down, maybe about 45 degrees mm -hmm. in this, this scenario. And I'm gonna get rid of the flaps. And it settles a little bit because mm -hmm. I had to add some power just after I got rid of the flaps, right. get the speed back. But no issues at all. All right, let's do a touch and go since I got a 5,000. Sounds good. And now uh, I believe we were pushing about eight to 10 minutes of this guy with mixed flying when we were flying him around before. So plenty of plenty of flight time uh, with the big 3S5000 and plenty of power too throughout the entire pack. Beautiful. And back up we go. Great, and then you suck everything in. Yeah. Now I hear my timer counting down. We should be getting towards the end of our uh, flight timer here. So what do you say we put everything back out and come in for a landing? Put the nose down a little bit, add some power. We won't count that first bounce. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. I've seen full-scale B-17 pilots bounce them before, too, in their old videos. Awesome. Great flight, Tom. That was great. B-17 flies great. It, it looks yeah. awesome. Oh, yeah. Awesome flying model. And I'm sure the silver one flies equally as well. Just a little different um, color. In fact, the full-scale pilots, when they flew between the F and the G with that big chin tone on top, mm -hmm. they didn't even know it was there. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't as a modeler either. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Now, Stuart's going to take you guys through a full unboxing of build. So we're going to toss it over to him right now. Okay, thank you very much, Tom and Max. Some good flying there, and as they suggested, 
you are now here with me for the unboxing and build sequence of this product profile. Now I say build, there is some assembly involved. Um, it's very, very straightforward and a few very simple steps. A little bit time consuming just because of its size, but the rewards are there to be had as can already have been seen from the flying footage. We'll uh, go through what's in the box and give you a, a rundown on a few more of the details and a little bit more on the spec too. Uh, and then I'm gonna mix it up a little bit and you'll see what I mean uh, in just a minute. So without further ado, let's get on with unboxing this beauty. And we're back. Uh, as I said, quite a big box, uh, some really uh, nice goodies inside. And let's talk through those. First of all, you get the two wing panels, and there's a point on that for the V2 that I'll come to in a minute. You get the beautiful fuselage at the bottom of the box, really nice, sizable chunk of foam. And again, one of the new refinements on the V2 is a much better, much more scale-like, and much uh, nicer appearing uh, paint finish, but also more importantly, these panel lines. They were like trenches before. We've done our homework properly this time and we've reduced these uh, uh, panel lines as much as we can for a much nicer and far more scale uh, appearance. Going around the table, what else do we have? Well, we have uh, four propellers. Uh, obviously, it's a four uh, engine model, but also we now include two additional spare propellers. All very good. Next to the propellers here, you see this. This is the chin turret. Um, the B17, uh, before when it came out first, it was just a F model with uh, the clear housing and no turret on the bottom. However, what we've now provided is a um, included an optional G uh, turret for both the silver version and uh, the olive drab version. Uh, so you can, if you wish, you can make the olive drab version a G model too. Because between the F and the G, the only real difference, uh, visibly anyway, uh, was the addition of the G chin turret. So a very easy and worthwhile mod for a nice point of differentiation between the green and the silver. Now going around, what else do you also have? Well, you have very thick and very nicely vacuum formed uh, cows and they're matched uh, to each one according to the anti-glare paint on the engine nacelles. Uh, you'll see the motors here, same motors as before. Now you may wonder why these motors aren't pre-installed. And very simply, the reason being is because that would have made the box that much bigger to have these pre-installed. But that said, it's a very easy task uh, to install each motor. It just takes a little while because you've got to do it four times. Then as we come around, more, uh, one of the most important things and a great bonus is uh, the now included fully illustrated and a fully English instruction manual. It gives you a really nice rundown uh, of the assembly and um, also at the back, if you see here, this is very important for the supplied uh, decals or decals that I'll get to in a minute. It gives a application guideline. So if you're a little bit unsure as to where exactly all of these stickers go, the manual will be your friend at that point. Uh, and then also uh, further on in the manual, there is flying tips and tricks with the B-17. But as you've already seen from the video, it does fly extraordinarily well. In fact, most reports that we've had are that on the first flight, it only needed a click or two of trim, and it does fly like a big trainer. Uh, it is a very big model, but as Tom already mentioned, it is very lightly loaded. And what that means is that you get a very soft, gentle flying giant in the air with a absolutely benign stall speed and uh, characteristics. Again, as you saw. Uh, going around again, before I get onto the stickers, uh, a bag of uh, wires and accessories and the point that Max made in the video uh, this is again an addition for the uh, V2 that the V1 did not have you get two harnesses for your battery you've got the uh, typical or traditional um, harness for two uh, 2200 uh, 3S batteries say uh, or if you want to run just one pack we've included an additional power Y harness so you can connect those two standard ones to a single bigger three cell pack such as the 5,000 milliamp hour, again, that Max mentioned. Uh, also in the bag, we come to the next and probably the most critical update on the V2 version. They are the wing joining spars. And then finally, we have the all important stickers. Now, if I pull this sheet out here, you'll see there is a 
big bag of stickers, decals or decals, whatever you wish to call them. Uh, there are two for each skiing. There are uh, two for the Olive Drab uh, F model and two representative of the G model in the natural finish or silver scheme, if you like. Now, these types of decals, I'll hold one up here. These are the same type of decal that you'd see in some of the uh, more recent Durafly models, such as the P40 and the uh, Spitfire. And what I'm going to do, actually, with this one, I'm going to show you how these are applied, but not on this model. The reason being, this is my little uh, twist I was telling you about. One of the uh, benefits of the V2 coming out of the box with no markings applied is that actually you can use, uh, use it as a canvas to make your own uh, unique scheme. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do it in this video, but I'm going to do it, uh, probably write a, an article or a blog on it in the coming weeks and months. And I'm actually going to do the uh, RAF Coastal Command Scheme. As Tom mentioned, uh, the B-17 is an iconic uh, American bomber from World War II, but it was also used with great success closing the Atlantic Gap by RF's Coastal Command. And if you can see from this image here, this is the scheme I'm going to go for. And again, especially the silver one, it really lends itself to being sprayed up into making it unique. That said, I will go ahead now and show you just how these decals are applied, and then we'll get on with the full set. Okay, so I've cleared off the table, I've got the stickers out in front of me, and I've got my uh, demonstration piece of foam. This is actually the towel from a uh, Avios Sea Fury that's no longer in use, but it will prove the point, uh, and the point is how easy these decals are to apply, and exactly how you go about doing that. Now, uh, it stresses so in the manual, and I'm going to say it again here, do, for the sake of ease, do apply the decals first, because you can handle each uh, component that needs the decals individually um, and apply those decals with ease on a flat surface and a handy cotton t-shirt and I'll show you why. There you go, there's a Hobby King t-shirt that we'll use for this. Now these sticker types, they have a clear fronting. Uh, they're basically vinyl type uh, decals and they are actually I don't know if you can see, but they are actually individually cut out, so you don't need to remove the sticker from the sheet itself uh, with a knife. All you do need to do, and I'll show you here, is just get a hold of the fronting and then gently pull that back like so. You can see that there's the, there's the decal revealed there, and then it should just come up from the sheet individually. Then, with the, let's do it this way, with a piece of foam laid down, you just want to apply it uh, by rubbing your finger across, making sure, sure there's no air bubbles in there, so you push out from the center. And then comes your t-shirt. Uh, the reason I use a t-shirt, it feels like, it, uh, like it's right, so that's, uh, that's what I do. It's given me the best results, and with that rubbing, you can really get, I don't know if you can see there, but you can see how it's just recessing into the panel lines. Now, of course, the panel lines on the CPU are bigger than the B17, but again, just for a, a point of demonstration, it really illustrates just how nicely these apply. That's the first bit of rubbing. Now this stickiness should not, and will not in fact, lift up any of the paint applied because it's just only low tack. However, when lifting, you do want to take care, not so much for the paint before it's thicker itself. See this corner here, it's good to start on a corner. You've got to peel this fronting horizontally so it doesn't lift the decal and then keep pulling, keep pulling like that. I'm not pulling up, I'm pulling across. And then what you should see there. Okay, it's lifted a little bit of this paint, but that's only because this is a very old sample. That won't happen on your shiny new B17. There we are. Uh, very nicely applied, but this isn't done yet. Oh, sorry, we're not done with this yet. Again, go over with that same cotton cloth and just rub down And there you have it, really, really nicely applied and that's not going to come off. However, just to be sure, an additional trick, if you have a covering iron with a sock on it, just get a very, very uh, low temperature setting on that iron and just go over it, just very, very carefully. And what that will do, that will activate the adhesive on the back of this, even more so than just rubbing it with the uh, heat and friction, and it will really ensure that these decals do not come off. So, that's how to apply the decals. I would have gone ahead and done that right away on this sample if I was keeping it in this scheme. However, I will be doing my own scheme later on um, in a coming video, an article. So look out for that. So right now we're going to go ahead with the assembly so I'm going to get everything back on the table and we can start with that.
Okay, so the first stage of assembly, after decals have been applied, and probably one of the most time consuming, simply because there's four of them, is installation of the motors. Uh, now these are bell type motors, and they install with uh, these grub screws or, or bolts that you see here. And it's important to get the uh, direction of rotation established before the wing goes together, and when you're connecting up the motor to the pre-installed ESC. Now these are counter-rotating, so that means uh, the left and right uh, propellers need to rotate in towards the fuselage. So uh, the way I like to do this before I've connected anything up is actually with a servo tester. If you get your motor uh, plugged into the free cables on the ESC and then connect uh, the ESC lead to your servo tester, you can actually test the rotation of the motor before you go ahead and bolt everything in. So that's a worthwhile tip. If you can get yourself one of these uh, Hobby King servo testers, I've just got a spare ESC on the back or you can uh, to power it or you can just use like a, a dry cell nickel metal hydride pack. But that's important. You must establish that rotation of direction, which of course for both sides, as I said, is counter-rotating. So the two props rotate inwards as it illustrates in the manual. So we're going to go ahead and get this together now and then we'll move on to probably the only other part of the build I want to mention, which is the chin turret on this G version and then a tip for installation of receiver when the wing is joined. Now from this image that you can see here, this is my 8-channel FR Sky receiver mounted directly on the wing and I've bunched all the wires up at the front. It's very neat and tidy, it means when you come to install your wing at the field, all you need to do is plug in the two servos from the fuselage, which are the elevator and rudder. Now in order to, these are the uh, rudder and elevator servos, now in order to get the wing onto the fuselage without any of the wires or the receiver uh, failing the fuselage, you actually need to do a slight modification. Again, it's illustrated in the manual. If you want to follow this procedure, that is, you'll need to do a slight modification. Uh, otherwise, you can just install it as you wish. But I really like this method because it's really nice and clean. So, take the lid off my Sharpie. Uh, you've got an opening here, which is the standard opening, but if you want to follow um, the method that I show in the manual, you'll need to actually remove probably about that much foam. Now this is just hollow fin foam, so structurally uh, it won't cause uh, any problems in doing so. And by removing that, not only do you have better access to the uh, two servo leads, but also it means, uh, again, as from this picture that you can see here with the receiver mounted on the wing and the wires all nicely and neatly bunched up together, that wing will just slide on with no effort whatsoever. So it makes it very, very easy uh, when it comes to assembling the, the uh, wing or assembling the model and putting the wing to the fuselage when you're down at the field. And now with that, it's really on with the assembly and we'll stop again when I get to the chin uh, turret on the G model because there's a little note I want to make there. Okay, now we've stopped at this point. Uh, something that's not actually covered in the uh, manual uh, necessarily in detail, but I'm gonna detail it to you here. And that's the G turret on the uh, G model. Now, with the original uh, F model, what you had, or well, we've got here, if I just lift this off, what that is, is a uh, additional air in cooling slot for the battery that's uh, housed up in the nose. Uh, when you're ready for flying. Now that's all well and good on the F model, but on the G, with the uh, new supplied turret, these foam slots aren't already cut out. So if you want to reap the benefit of that additional air encoding slot, you will need to cut out these slots. However, how do you then get your uh, 50 cows in the nose and permanently fixed? Well, as you can see from the sequence of shots we've got here, what I've done First of all, with a uh, X-Acto knife that we sell, I've just carefully cut out um, both at the top and the bottom of the, uh, the ridge of the turret. Now, obviously, I've done this uh, rather quickly for the uh, benefit of viewers and for this video, but you guys, I'm sure, will do a much better job. Now, I've left a piece of foam 
in the center again along that ridge of the turret. The reason being is you want that piece of foam in the center of the turret to house the actual gun itself. Then uh, before you glue those in, just go around it with either a black marker and then if you go over as I did, you maybe want to touch it up with a silver marker. And again, I've done quite a rough job on this because I'm quite rushed with the video, but I'm sure you guys will do a much finer job. Anyway, at that point, uh, with again the pointy ends of the guns, you'll then be able to, you can see where I made a mistake there, but you'll then be able to use the, uh, the actual barrel of the gun to push these into the foam. And when you do, uh, you'll want to apply glue not only on the turret, but on those gun ends itself. And then just by pushing them in and aligning it to the trailing edge of the uh, canopy, as you can see here, you've approximately, okay, this is a little out of alignment, but you've approximately got a uh, very nicely installed uh, chin turret on the G model. Now, on with the rest of the build. Okay, so there we have it, the assembly of the B17G and F. Uh, there is really no difference at all in the build sequence other than the G turret edition, if you choose to do so, between the olive drab and the neutral or silver colored B17s. So this is the V2 B17 from H King, a Hobby King brand, just around approximately 70 inches or 1875 millimeters for two three cell batteries or one big three cell battery with the new additional uh, power wire lead adapter. Uh, so as you can see, it is a very sizable model once assembled, but it breaks down nicely for transport. It flies very, very well as uh, Max and Tom have already touched on and uh, it assembles relatively quickly as well. The motors take the most time as I said. The decals that are here, uh, as recommended in the manual, pre-apply those uh, before you go about the full assembly. I myself will be doing a completely new scheme on this, that's why I haven't applied the decals on the model so you can see it in its naked state. And again, that's another great feature of the V2 B17. It comes without the markings applied, so if, like me, you want to do your own scheme, you've got a nice blank canvas for that. Now, as we're talking about looks, again, you can see just how uh, uh, much the reduced the panel lines are really, really helps put it a step above the older V1. And again, assembled, assembles very, very quickly, and it looks stunning and flies very well to boot. So we hope you've enjoyed this product profile. There will be more uh, models coming from H-King in the future, so look out for that. And until next time, I'll see you then.